So we're looking at Robert Thomas in the blue font. And he started these paragraphs off very hard to dissect because he's not paying attention to the actual words of the text. And working from there, he's digressing and um, creating, editorializing. He says, unlike human planners who cannot schedule simultaneously simultaneous parts on the same program unless they are in separate rooms, Guy has, has indicated that no prophecy remains to be fulfilled between, before either of these events. That brings a whole different thought in there. God is, has, remember, my paragraph says, God has foreordained and he has decreed and he's implemented. There's no question about planning. He's foreordained it. This will happen. And it doesn't require cooperation on the other part of the humans. They will choose to believe precisely what he's decreed of their own volition. And he will implement it but not violating human volition. Now, that's a different story than God just kind of, well, let's plan this, and uh, we'll do this in separate rooms. He says, well, there's no prophecy that remains to be fulfilled before either of these events. Too much to think about offside, editorialized. He goes on to say, if it were to turn out that one of the two preceded the other, it won't because he foreordained it. God has not been forthright with people. He doesn't have to be forthright with people. He can do what he wants. And what he wants to do and does do, he foreordained and he decreed and he implemented. Case closed. Now, God does not violate the volition of man. He could if he wanted to. Matter of fact, he brings you to a point sometimes of no return if you keep rejecting him. And he draws you to choose to believe in him. So this, the, the wording here is not scriptural. And it's making you think like he tries to think. God is not like man. So God has not been forthright with people. It doesn't, there's no question. He can be whatever he wants, forthright or fifthright. It questions his ethics to suggest that one of the two is not imminent, if in fact that it is the case. Why do you even question this? God foreordains. He decrees. He elects. He implements. Right? And he intervenes in, within human lives. Yet people will choose of their own volition. But how did I choose of my own volition not to believe until I was 17 and then of my own volition I chose to believe? mystery but that's he is sovereign so you question whether or not god's sovereign is nonsense you're not the reason whether god's sovereign or not just tell me how he reasons in the sense of his coordination and election and implementation so would he misinform readers of scripture by asking them to be ready for two happenings that could occur at any moment when actually one of them will precede the other of course not god cannot lie The Bible presents no sequential arrangement of these two events, the rapture and the second coming, as it does for other future happenings. It prophesies nothing that must occur before these two, including nothing to indicate that one of the two must occur before the other. They are both next items on God's prophetic calendar. What he says, we're not going to be subject to the wrath of God. Now, if we are, that's who God is. But he says he does not lie. But the problem is it's plain and clear that when the tribulation starts, the wrath begins and the church won't be there. This can only find fulfillment if the two occur at the same time. Were either to come before the other, the biblical account would have been misleading and that second would not have been imminent until the first occurred. And the problem with that is he's saying certain things are imminent or you act in God's word with the seven churches as if they would be imminent, and even though there's 2,000 years ago, it, it was supposed to be imminent. But even though those thing, problems were solved in the temple time, so he's not investigating scripture enough and reporting, observing and reporting. 
So he says, the God, the master planner, is the only one for whom the two events are not imminent because he knows precisely what they will happen. No, that's not true. God knows precisely when they will happen because he foreordained them and decreed them. He doesn't have to look down to see what he knows will happen, see what man will do. God is sovereign. Man will choose to do what God's decreed he will do, but man's volition won't be violated. I guess you didn't have that. I don't see he understands that. With that knowledge, he has instructed us. He knows what we're going to happen, so he says, well, I know what mankind will do. So then he says, well, expect them that both at any moment. God doesn't need to know what's going to happen. He knows what's going to happen because he decreed it to happen. Surely he would not mislead people into expecting both to be imminent if one of the two is not. But the problem with that is the imminency of Christ's return was acted upon. The thought of him returning soon in the first century in those seven churches and in a number of places he maintains, and I don't, that he said, well, they're thinking he was coming again in the second coming or the rapture. So they said, well, Jesus is going to come and fix this and that'll be imminent. So we'll persevere through these difficulties. That's wrong too. Because if you read the context, most of those things were temporal. Then you die, which they did in the first century, somewhere in the first century, and they're dead in Christ. So they're with it, present with him in heaven, and they're waiting in a wonderful presence of the Lord for him to decide when he's coming. He's decreed when he's coming. He's going to He'll do that. He says he does. He hasn't missed a, a boat yet. And he's decreed it because he foreordained it. And then those who are dead in Christ will rise first, go to the uh, heaven, marry him, and somewhere along the way, I forget which is the sequence, they'll go to the great to, to the judgment seat of Christ and get their rewards. And for persevering in the faith. So anyway, the comings of Christ this is where we started all the left off. The comings of Christ in Revelation 2 to 3. Some are temporal, and some are the rapture, and some are the second coming. You have to decide by context and reading carefully. In Revelation 2 to 3, necessitate that both the church's rapture and the beginning of Daniel's 70th week be imminent and hence occur simultaneously. But the beginning of Daniel, the, uh, the church's rapture <coughs> may not be the coming of Christ in some of those uh, churches, their, their immediate temporal resolutions, the coming of Christ in the temporal life of people like Jezebel, and the sickness came on her and her followers. So exegetical analysis sees that the nine references to these comings require contemporaneousness. That is, why I differ with those who say exegetical proof of the pre-tribulational rapture does not exist. It's not pre-tribulational if it's co-imminent. One occurs precisely at the same time as the other because of the, if the wrath of God begins, the church is not subject to wrath. So he's, he's defeating his own argument. Clear exegetical evidence for the imminence of two future happenings requires a pre-tribulational pre rapture. Two events will come at once, one of which, amen, one of which is the translation of the church. The only way this can happen is for the church to enter the Father's house, not before, not after, but at the moment the hour of trial begins. So now he says, dual imminency of D Daniel's 70th week and the church's deliverance from the wrath of that week is not the only exegetical proof of the pre-tribulational rapture of the church, but it deserves its place alongside other evidence because of its prominence in Revelation 2-3. to But he hasn't explained that because some things are temporal. God, Jesus' uh, uh, coming is, is sometimes temporal, and immediately in the church of Philadelphia, they'll uh, receive the rewards for the perseverance, which it may say those are the eternal rewards, but that'll be 2,000 years plus later when the church is raptured, evidently, and the tribulation starts at the precise same moment, and then they get rewarded for that perseverance 2,000 years ago. He never explained that, and so it's confusing. So, here's what I said. 
So at the point in historical time that God in his foreordination, there it is, decrees, implementation, when the tribulation period is imminent, ready to occur immediately, then Christ will come soon, quickly, immediate, imminently to rapture, to rescue the saints who are alive during that time in their alive mortal bodies in history, as well as all believers of the church age who are dead in Christ. They all go to heaven. They all get rewarded for persevering in the various times throughout history, these 2,000 years especially, and others will be rewarded as well. For it is the time of the day of the Lord to begin, and the church will not be there because at that precise time the rapture will have occurred. To speculate that believers throughout the age might be encouraged to persevere despite the fact that their perseverance might be based on some temporal scenario that is not true and or a misconception of that the day of the Lord was imminent at a particular time is not in view. When Jesus says he's going to come again and to fix something and he'll do it soon, he did it in the first century. If he's talking about when he comes and when the tribulation begins, he'll be there quickly, that's the tribulation period, that's the rapture, all at once at the same time. You have to read context. For scripture clearly indicates in, in numerous places, both the Old Testament and the New Testament, the events that comprise the rapture, day of the Lord, the second coming. We have all these passages you read, and you read them and become familiar with them. They say, that hasn't happened yet, that hasn't happened yet, so we can't be in the tribulation period. So, The latter chapters of Revelation give you the picture of what the tribulation is going to be so that those seven churches and all the churches throughout the church age and all people, all Gentile and Jewish believers in all dispensations, they will know, and we have this in Ezekiel, and we have this in Jeremiah. When did Israel all believe and become the chosen people of God once again since they were denied being, no longer being the chosen people of God for a, for a number of generations. And all of a sudden they will be. Well, if they're not, look at Israel today. They're not, they're not all believers. They're not perfect human beings without sin, living hundreds and hundreds of years and knowing the Bible perfectly. So we, obviously we're not in the tribulation period, nor at the end of the second coming, when the second coming comes at the tribulation period end. So, Nevertheless, believers who are subjected to difficulties, temporal time, testing, discipline, are commanded, encouraged to be faithful with a view to speedy deliverance from such temporal difficulties outside of the purview of the events of the day of the Lord, and also, I say and also, I like this, and also for rewards. So you keep that, you persevere, you know that it's not going to be, some of it's not going to be fun. Some of us say, keep on persevering, and you may die, and not have it all released. Uh, sometimes you pray and you get delivered. Sometimes you, you continue on in your uh, yourself difficulty, because the more you share your faith, I've learned, the more difficult times you had. I had a couple of people. One lady put on a, had a, a shirt on, talked all about Jesus. It was incomprehensible what the language was. I just couldn't get it, even though I tried to read it. And then she had a hat with Jesus on it. And I said, ma'am, who, what, who, what is this Jesus? I wanted her to explain to me what she thought. And she said, Jesus is God. And then I said, well, okay, um, what should I do with that? I don't care what you do with it. Wow, you wear a t-shirt professing Jesus in some matter that you think he's God, which he is. But then to what extent? Some, she could be a oneness Pentecostal where Jesus, only Jesus is God, there's no trinity. So Jesus stopped being God, became man, he died on the cross and went back to be God. And then she, then she puts her hand up, said, talk to the hand, I'm not answering any more questions. He got real abusive. So, I, you know, I, when somebody has Jesus on their hat, or I, I ask them, but I don't try to be informative, I ask questions saying, tell me what you think. And I got that reaction. So, I get rewarded, but it's uncomfortable. I really don't like persevering, but I don't, I, I don't neglect sharing my faith. It's almost like I'm urged to do that, especially if somebody comes up with Jesus on her, on her t-shirt. But the, uh, the sentence with it was incomprehensible. But I asked, and I got the hand. In any case, 
when all believers will be taken up to heaven, rapture, receive rewards, or suffer loss of rewards for all who, dead are in Christ, are alive to the rapture. 